Thanks for having me here today. Um, I'm going to be talking uh, about a, a project that we've been working on. Um, it's the Genomic Open Source Breeding Informatics Initiative. It's a bit of a mouthful, but GOBI for short. Uh, this is a, a project funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. It's a collaboration with Cornell, uh, Boyce Thompson Institute, CIMIT, ERI, and ICRASAT. So for the talk today, I'm, I'm going to give a little bit of a background. Uh, uh, since I, I don't know a lot of you, I'll, I'll have just a little bit of background on myself, and then go into some background on the project. And then I, I'm going to spend some time talking you know, at a high level about genomic selection and, and more generically breeding decision support. Uh, give kind of my two cents on, on, in terms of a modern breeding program, what that would look like. And then uh, close out talking more specifically about GOBI, exactly what it is, talk about the architecture, and what type of progress we're making uh, on the project itself. So, so as Susan said, I, I did start out as, as an animal breeder. Are we good? Okay. All right. I did start out as an animal breeder, although at this point I have been working in plant breeding longer than, than animal breeding, so I, I consider myself more plant breeding than animal breeder at this point. I, I did my bachelor's degree in animal science at the University of Tennessee. Uh, for my master's degree, I, I went specifically into animal breeding. Um, a lot of the uh, cattle evaluations, breed associations, ran their uh, genetic evaluations through the University of Georgia, and I did a lot of work with growth modeling, random regression models. Particularly the way the data was set up, it, it didn't really uh, lend itself well to using higher order polynomials, so we, we did a lot of work with spline functions there to, to have more robust evaluations. Going from my master's to my PhD, I, I switched gears uh, somewhat, went more into statistical, what I would call statistical genomics. And this was more in human applications, so I was working in disease diagnostics, uh, using uh, expression data to uh, diagnose uh, tumor types uh, specifically. Did a lot of work with uh, swarm intelligence uh, for feature selection. Uh, that was actually, you know, quite a lot of fun. Uh, you know, it's really based off of, you know, how insects themselves, individual insects, not real intelligent, but you know, get them together, they can do really complex things just by having a, a simple set of rules in terms of how these units interact. And, and uh, so that was a lot of fun. And then, uh, you know, leaving my, my PhD, I, I decided to, to switch gears again after being in animal breeding and then human genetics decided to, to give plants a try. And I've, I've been in plants ever since then. Uh, there's a lot about plant breeding that I, that I really like and, and find incredibly uh, Interesting, so I was in the quantitative genetics group, um, eventually took lead of that group, did a lot of work on breeding scheme optimization um, and decision support systems. So I, I started off doing a lot of model development, but then found out pretty quickly that if you actually want to get the models used, you have to put a lot of work into actually building decision support systems that uh, the, the breeders uh, find user friendly. So that brief background, I'll shift a little bit to, to GOBI. Um, so always good to start off with the mission statement in terms of what exactly we're trying to do. So enable the implementation of genomic selection and marker-assisted selection as part of routine breeding programs for staple crops in the developing world. Uh, you know, so that's, that says a lot. I, you know, to me, one of the real key things in that mission statement that really affects the scope significantly is the word routine. So it's one thing to be able to develop some capabilities to implement genomic selection. It's another thing to really build systems and, and actually drive breeding pro programs to routine use of, of this information. So they're two completely different scopes. And it, and it does have a, a large impact in terms of how you approach a project like this. You know, to be able to get to routine implementation, you, you have to do a lot of development and implementation around, um, you know, foundational IT capabilities for what we call breeding decision support sites data management, analysis, visualization, and, and what I'll call integrated decision support. And I'll talk a little bit more about this uh, later in the talk. You know, so, uh, you know, here's a nice slide sort of, uh, you know, putting together, you know, what the, what the problem is that, that we're trying to solve, why we're doing it. Uh, so to date, the, the promise of the genomics revolution has not been delivered in, in you know, staple crops and the, the um, you know, sub-Sahara Africa and South Asia. I would say in general that the promise of genomic selection just hasn't really been delivered across the board. Although certainly I, I think where uh, 
uh, you know, a lot of these breeding programs in the developing world are versus where some of the large industrial breeding programs are is, is night and day when it comes to how well information is deployed into, you know, selection and, and breeding programs. So, you know, breeders do not have the high quality support they need to routinely use this information. So we're really, you know, when we're talking about genomic information, just information in general, I mean, you know, these days it is very high volume, high dimensional data. So, so this age in which you can, you know, look at some data in an Excel spreadsheet and be able to, to crunch some numbers and make advancements and really efficiently run a breeding program that way is just really not feasible anymore. Uh, to be able to really effectively use all this information that's generated, I mean, you have to have, you know, effective data management, you know, that is the foundation of everything. Uh, you need to be able to integrate genomic and phenotypic information. That, that can be more challenging than it might seem just at, at face value. Obviously, you have to have these analysis pipelines that can turn this data into information and, and this is decision support tools, which is really what delivers it to the breeders. So the GOBI project, uh, in, in short, really aims to put in place a lot of these capabilities that are needed to be able to actually routinely implement the use of marker information in, into, into these breeding programs. So at this point, I, I'd just like to to shift gears, I would say, a little bit and talk more broadly about genomic selection. So, I mean, you know, if, if the goal of this project is to, to really implement routinely genomic selection, I, I think it's good to, to have a little bit of an idea of, you know, why we would even want to implement genomic selection routinely in these breeding programs. You know, I'm not, I'm not going to spend a, a, a lot of time on this slide, but, but I think it's always important when, when you're talking about breeding, at least from a quantitative geneticist standpoint, is, is to, to go back to really you know, the breeder's equation, you know, the ultimate goal, right? So given some, some breeding objective that you have, I mean, your goal as a breeder is to, to, to impose selection and, and drive towards achieving that breeding, uh, that breeding goal. And, you know, really the, the most objective way to, to measure your progress in that area is your response to selection per year or per unit of time. Genomic selection, you know, has promise, I think, to, to really uh, affect uh, you know, basically every component of, of the breeder's equation here. Not to say that, uh, you know, an implementation will affect every component. I think every trait, every breeding program is a little bit different, and I don't think there is one size fits all when it comes to implementation of genomic selection. There's certainly bad ways to implement it that are bad for every scenario, but there's not one, one truly good way, I think, that will work for everything. You know, in terms of intensity and, and genetic variation, you know, the idea of early discarding is something that I, I think is very promising. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about, you know, sort of a generic uh, view of a breeding, uh, you know, a breeding pipeline and where early discarding can fit in there. You know, incorporation of genomic information in early stage trials and multi-year evaluations, uh, it does bring added accuracy. Um, uh, especially when, when your data sets aren't nearly robust in terms of having a large amount of phenotypic data. Bringing in this genomic information to augment your phenotypes can, can increase your accuracy there. And then, of course, early recycling. Early recycling, we can think of the most extreme case, which is just recycling without any phenotypic information, but when you, when you think about the number of years it takes from, from making an initial cross to actually having a, a, you know, a finished line that you're releasing for either recycling or to the public. There's a lot of time there. So, you know, even shaving a, a year off of that cycle can actually have a pretty big impact in terms of your response. So just to, to frame this discussion, I, I'm just going to use a, 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 an example of a, a little bit of work we did with, with Erie on, on breeding for zinc content. This is, you know, certainly not any type of thorough evaluation of the potential for genomic selection, but, but the question was, you know, they, they had a program where they were trying to Im improve zinc content, and there was uh, just a question of, well, you know, is genomic selection an option here? Is this something that we might be able to implement? So we had a, I would consider a relatively small training set, but, but that's always relative, I suppose, of uh, 257 diverse rice lines. Uh, we had genotype data from a 700K uh, chip. Um, Ran just a you know simple ridge regression bluff analysis on it, nothing nothing too fancy there. We looked at you know the the effect of the, the number of markers included in the model. Um, you know really looking at at what point are you getting diminishing returns. Uh, we did some filtering um, on minor allele frequency and percent missing. We did a five-fold cross validation and we did uh, 300 random um, permutations. Um, and, and these random permutations were just uh, 
you know, both random permutations of the, the cross-validation, what went into the five-fold cross-validation in terms of random permutations of the markers that were being trained in the model. So we weren't doing any real feature selection on these markers. They were randomly being included into the models. What we got back, uh, I, would, I would consider it to be, uh, I, I would say it's promising. Uh, you know, I, I think this is one of the challenges with genomic selection. Uh, you know, we were talking about it a little bit earlier today, is that you know, it's, it has been sold as sort of this, this revolutionary uh, way of doing breeding. When you get back accuracies in the range of 0.3 to 0.5, sometimes that can be a little bit underwhelming. But uh, you can actually do quite a lot with these types of accuracies. If you look at the, the number of markers, interestingly, it, it didn't really change necessarily the, the range of accuracy. And I should say, just across these permutations, this is just the distribution of, of the accuracies that were returned and the frequencies that they're returned, is that you notice that, that while the, the actual range of the accuracies didn't change, you, you got a much tighter distribution as you got up to 50K markers. So you, you, were, you were more consistently in that you know, 0.3 to 0.5 range in terms of accuracy. So you had yeah, somewhat more, more robust predictions. Beyond 50K markers, it, it really didn't make much of a difference. I'm, I'm also including up here you know, just some results from a, a, a very large uh, review article on genomic selection where they were looking at lots of different traits, lots of different species, and, and kind of the ranges in uh, genomic prediction accuracy that they were getting. And, and you can see that there actually are you know, quite a bit of similarities between this sort of broad scale range and versus what we were seeing with this. And that is that, I mean, for complex traits, you know, 0.3 to 0.5 range, it, it, at least for the near future, is probably an area of accuracy that you're going to have to be working within if you're going to be implementing genomic selection on a routine basis. So that, um, that brings the question, well, you know, what exactly can you do with the correlation of 0.3 to 0.5? And, you know, when I was in, uh, you know, working in industry, you know, one of, one of the big, big parts of my job was implementation of, of genomic selection into routine use in, in the North American maize program. And, and so this was kind of a question that we were faced with at one point, which is, okay, we've done lots of cross-validations. We know how accurate our predictions are. Well, yeah, what, what, what exactly are we going to do with that? Like, what, what are the implications of that? Um, you know, where I'm going to go here is, is probably going to reveal a bit of that bias towards maize, which is, in maize, you know, this idea of early discarding actually, actually can make a, a pretty huge difference. And at point 0.5, you could say this is more optimistic, but, but actually I, I would say that for a trait like yield, point 0.5 really isn't too optimistic. That's, that's a very achievable accuracy given that, that you're, you're doing your training correctly and you can probably even get a little bit higher than that. But at that accuracy, here I, I, I basically have just done a bivariate plot from, this is just a, a simulated data set where, I, you know, the true value is the y-axis, the, the predicted value is the x-axis, simulated to have exactly a correlation of 0.5 with each other, right? And so the, the green line basically indicates anything above that green line really are the top, you know, you know 2% or so of, of, of the lines in your population. These are the ones that you're trying to identify. Um, and these, these vertical green bars right here are, well, if I were to start discarding early based off of genomic selection, really what implications does that have? And I, I will say that, that there are certain correlations where you're probably better off about thinking of getting rid of the bad stuff, not necessarily picking the good stuff. And I'd say at, at point 0.5, you're, in the, you're solidly in that scenario of, well, that's, well, we're probably good enough to get rid of the bad stuff, not necessarily good enough to, to pick the winners. But what you can see is that, you know, if you don't do anything, that what you plan out in your field, about 2% of the lines that you have in that trial are actually lines that you want to advance. And I will say there is a significant cost to advancing lines that are going to fail later. There's a huge monetary cost to that. So it, the, the, both, both errors actually are, are important in, in these breeding programs. If I were to throw away 70% of my material before I ever even go to the field, you know, I think breeders typically are going to get, you know, pretty focused on that, that number of 17%. That's going to hurt them. They'll, they'll, they'll cringe a little bit at that. But you've, you've, you've effectively tripled the frequency of, of the lines that you want to identify and what you have in the field. And so that really is shifting your odds significantly in your favor to actually being able to identify these top lines by getting rid of a lot of, 
uh, this. And I, you know, one thing to keep in mind, which you know, you'll see in a later slide, is that in these early stages, you don't have much accuracy to start with. Uh, you know, at 50%, you're, you're losing less. Uh, you're still getting some good enrichment. At 30%, you're basically losing nothing. Um, and and you're, you're, you're getting less enrichment, but it's, it's actually quite safe to throw away the, you know, basically the bottom third of, of your lines. You really don't have to worry about losing something good. When you get into correlation of 0.3, you can, you can see it gets to be more of just sort of like a, a cloud. It's, uh, it, it becomes a little bit more challenging. But, you know, the same trend holds true. Um, that no matter what selection you're doing, I, I mean, because it is positively correlated, you are actually enriching for the lines that you want to identify. You're going to lose a lot of your top lines. Um, and how much of those top lines you actually lose uh, is going to depend on your threshold. But you're also increasing the probability that the lines that you do advance are actually the lines that you want to advance, which is an important factor within the breeding program. So I want to talk a little bit about the, the concept of, of an integrated breeding scheme, because it, it's not just genomic selection, right? So I mean, when we're, when we're looking at optimizing a breeding program, it's about taking all the information you have, uh, using it the best way you can, and then optimizing the way that you're doing your breeding scheme, uh, the way that you're screening lines to have the most efficient program possible. And at a high, you know, every breeding program is a little bit different, but at a high level, you, you know, there's a, a lot of similarities. So you can have a phase where you're, you know, you're selecting parents, you're making crosses to generate new variability. There's going to be some, uh, some period where you're selecting on individuals, either you're doing DH or you're selfing out to get to some level of uh, inbred. Uh, depending on whether or not, uh, depending on the crop, you, you, you may do some test crossing. And then you're going to start going into trials, right? And the, and the way that these, these trials are typically set up is, you know, in the early stages, you're going to have lots of lines, very few replications for each line, probably very few environments. And as you get down, uh, you know, further and further into the, the process, you're going to have much fewer lines, but you're going to be investing much more in those lines by planning them across a, a lot more geographies and getting a lot more certainty about it. And so when we talk about decision support in general, there's obviously a lot of places where information, bringing the best information possible can make a huge difference. So, you know, certainly in these early stages, you know, marker-assisted and genomic selections can play a, a very big role, whether it's actually doing genomic predictions, whether it's screening for certain traits uh, that you really have to have in your germplasm. As you get down into the, the actual advancement process, certain advancement tools, ability to do multi-year analysis, AOAs, head-to-heads, all these types of analyses uh, uh, play a, a big role in the efficiency of how well you can actually pick out the right lines and move them through your system. And then obviously parental selection is another huge area where uh, both marker uh, information as well as decision support can play a, a huge role in terms of uh, you know, how good you are at identifying what lines need to be crossed. So in general, when we talk specifically about genomic selection and breeding in general, I mean, there's two things that you're really trying to do to optimize is you want to be able to screen as much material as you can efficiently, and you want to reduce the length of the cycle. Right? I mean, it really just goes back to that breeding equation. And there's a lot of areas that, that marker information specifically can come into this in terms of widening the, the, the funnel through uh, early discarding. You can potentially screen a lot more material. You can also use early discarding to sort of uh, rearrange how this part of the system set up, which can also lead to, to early recycling. Bringing marker information into parental selection can give you higher accuracies with less phenotypic data, which also can contribute to, to, to faster recycling. So if, if we make this, uh, and, and I, I think that it's you know, a very reasonable assumption that, that bringing the right information at the right time and using your data the best way that you possibly can is going to help your breeding program. You know, the question becomes, in a breeding program, how do you effectively do this? So, you know, my, my early days in, in plant breeding, you know, I, I hit a lot of barriers because I would do a lot of work on developing these great new models, but then no one ever used them. And a lot of that just had to do with the fact that, you know, uh, these breeding programs are, are, are pretty, you know, well-oiled machines, uh, tight timelines. Uh, if, if you're introducing something that, that, 
that generates a lot of value, if it comes at the wrong time, it doesn't really matter. Like it, you, you have to be able to, to integrate it into the breeding program. And this actually uh, is where a lot of work, I think, gets overlooked. I think it's underappreciated how difficult it actually can be to bring all this information to bear to routine use in a breeding program. So if we look at, at the major components of, of what needs to happen, well, obviously you have to have quality, cost-effective data collection, right? If you don't have good data, then, well, nothing else really matters. You need to have good environmental data, good phenotypic data, and uh, good genotypic data. But beyond that, you have to have effective data management and curation. This is part of having good, high-quality data. You need to have some stage gate here. But you also have to have access to this data. You have to be able to manage this data. You're not going to be able to pull together multi-year evaluations if data is scattered all over the place. You have to have efficient workflows and accurate analysis pipelines. And you also have to have user-friendly and comprehensive decision support tools. That goes back to uh, if I'm going to be making decisions based off this data, at the very least, it shouldn't be making my life more difficult. So from the perspective of GOBI, you know, we're working with you know, public sector breeding programs. Specifically, we're working with CIMIT, we're working with ICRASAT, and we're working with ERI. But these are, I think, representative of, of, of where a lot of these programs are in terms of their you know, actual ability to, to utilize these new technologies. And so uh, I think it's important to understand exactly where they're at, because that tells you where you need to go to be able to actually implement these, these methodologies. So in terms of environment and phenotype, they, they do have a lot of environmental and phenotypic information. So they have large multi-year data sets, but there's no centralized you know, storage systems currently adopted. And that, that is actually a big problem, right? Because uh, you know, if, if you're a breeder and you have all your data you know, on your computer, that may work OK for you. But if you actually want to develop decision support tools that are going to be pulling this information, are going to be combining with genotypic information, you can't do that if it's just scattered all over the place. There are, I think, significant curation efforts underway to clean up a lot of this historic data. You know, there are decisions that are going to have to be made. Some data, you just write it off as a lost cause, and you say, you know what, it's not worth the effort to try and bring that in. But you know, this right now is actually a, a huge sticking point. And um, I, I think progress is being made, but really, until this system is in place, genomic selection is going to be really difficult to implement, and, and marker statistics selection in general. In terms of genomic information, I, markers have been deployed, I think, for screening based off of large QTL effects. I think that's been done pretty well in, in a lot of these breeding programs. Um, the, the problem is, is that they're, you know, the way they're being deployed is SSR markers. They're not high throughput. It's not necessarily easy to screen a lot of you know, large populations cost effectively. And the idea of doing genomic selection, uh, there's simply no tools in, in, in place. There, there, there are data sets that exist, and there have been a lot of POCs that have been conducted, and they've shown a lot of promise. So, I mean, it's, it's not that there isn't some idea that genomic selection is beneficial, um, but they're, they're still at the very early stages of, of tackling the logistical challenges of implementation. And the logistical challenges of implementation are actually quite significant, which is, you know, how do you sample these lines, get genotype data, return that genotype data, get predictions prior to, to making these decisions. And there's a lot that goes into that. And, and they clearly need a, you know, a significant capability improvements for large-scale uh, uh, genomic selection implementation. You know, sampling, DNA, extracting, uh, DNA extraction, and genotyping costs need to be re reduced significantly. And I would say, actually, probably the cost of sampling and DNA extraction are, are huge barriers for them right now. Uh, that they're, they're going to have to work on. And then lab throughput needs to increase significantly to be able to actually handle the quantity of data that they'll have to go through. I think, I think for the most part, these CG centers uh, have, have come to the conclusion to get the throughput to start. So in terms of tackling the, the, the problem of genotyping, um, there, there, there are different ways you can do it, but you know, I, I think that when people think of genomic selection, you think that, that you need huge amounts of, of markers genotyped on an individual line to actually successfully implement genomic selection. And that really isn't the case. I mean, it's not the case for a couple of reasons. One is, I, in the animal side, which is where I came from, it, 
you do need a, a huge number of, of markers, but, but animals really are you know, quite a bit different than plants in terms of uh, genomic selection. You typically don't need as, as many markers as you think, and, and it's really for you know, a, a couple of reasons. The, the major reason being that there's significant population structure within your data set, right? So if, if you're dealing with you know, a cross between two inbred lines and you, and you generate, let's say, 150 you know, new lines for screening out of that, uh, those lines themselves are, are actually pretty highly related to each other. And so there's not necessarily going to be a lot of, of marker segregating between that. And so there are, there are different ways that you can do genotyping and approach genotyping that can actually significantly reduce the amount of, of markers you need to have. In, in terms of the, uh, the crops that we're working with in the CG, uh, CGIRs, there are actually a lot of, um, you know, markers that, that are tracking either diagnostic or, or, or pretty tightly linked to major QTLs. You know, for that, it's, it's, it's pretty easy to do a, a first round of screening based off of some very low density diagnostic markers, throwing out lines that just simply don't have these key traits of interest prior to going into genomic selection in a second stage. When we get to genomic selection, I, you know, here's where, you know, having a, a strategy for uh, generating the higher density data is really important. And so this concept of, you know, strategic genotyping, I think, um, really can play a major role here. And, and that really goes back to the fact that, you know, when, when you're dealing with the actual selection candidates, the majority of these you're actually going to discard, you're never really going to use against one, one, once you've thrown them away, is that if you know the parents, and the parents, relatively speaking, are a much smaller number of lines. So the number of lines that you're actually actively using as, uh, for breeding crosses are, are relatively small within any breeding program. You can have a huge number of new recombinants. You can actually genotype these, these lines at a very low density um, and, and impute quite accurately back up through to the higher densities. You can impute back up to the density of the parents. From the parents, you can impute back up to uh, densities of key ancestors. Um, but what you find is that, you know, that there's, there, there's, there's two areas where this comes into play. One is that the imputation itself can be quite accurate, because really all you have to do is track recombinations. The second is, is that the way a lot of these genomic selection models work is there is, you know, a, a relatively high tolerance to, well, I won't say relatively high, there is a tolerance to genotyping errors or impu imputation errors. Uh, uh, within these models. And so you can easily go through and look at, you know, really how low you can go through your imp imputation without actually affecting your genomic selection predictions. And, and oftentimes it, it's surprising how little markers you really do need to genotype at this stage. This, however, is from an analysis standpoint, from a data management standpoint, uh, makes things a lot more complicated. And that's where a lot of this, you know, infrastructure, particularly this building by Gobi, can come in and play, play a huge role in terms of making genomic selection more, more feasible. You know, I've talked on this before, but, you know, data management is obviously a key piece. Uh, you know, trial management, I think, is, is probably the biggest barrier that we're dealing with right now. Unfortunately, there have been some setbacks in this area. Um, the hope is that, that we'll get back on track and have those systems up and running, but I think we're still uh, at least a couple years off before routine implementation of trial management systems in place. Uh, you know, from genotype, there are, you know, genotype data repositories available, but there's a big difference between building a system that can store uh, genotype information and a system that actually is integrated into your breeding work processes that allow you to use genotypic information to make decisions at the right time. And, you know, currently there is no solution. Solutions exist. I, I mean, they exist in, you know, some of these industry, uh, you know, large-scale breeding programs, but certainly in, in the public sector, no, no current, uh, you know, uh, solutions exist or are adopted. And right now, especially with the higher density uh, information, large portions of the data are still stored in flat files. I know, you know, one of the things that was a little eye-opening for me is, you know, when I first, you know, talked to some of these centers and just asked them what data they had to give us an idea of what we were working with, um, after about a month, got back to me and, and said, this is what I think we have. And that, that sort of tells you where exactly the, the, the data management is right now, that, that a question that should be relatively simple to answer is, ends up being a very difficult question to answer. <clears throat>
Analysis pipelines, that's obviously you know, one of the last key pieces that are required to be able to you know, take all this information and deliver it into you know, uh, uh, usable information for making decisions. I think that, that for the most part, these types of tools and workflows already exist. I don't think there necessarily needs to be a lot of work on this. Uh, where where the, the, the key gap is, is that routine implementation really requires uh, integration, also standard operating procedures for many tasks. And so being able to actually deliver this information uh, requires integration across many, many systems, which is currently a, a, another big challenge that, that we face. And so when we think about Integrated breeding support, there's a lot of components that, that have to come together and interact fairly, fairly seamlessly with each other. So we've already talked about you know, trial management, uh, genomic data management, uh, you know, LIMS, which is you know, lab you know, information management system sample tracking. Breeders typically are going to be accessing this data in a different way that the lab's going to be accessing this data. So you typically are going to have two different UIs. All of these systems need to be able to, to talk and communicate with each other and, and pass information relatively seamlessly back and forth. There is another effort, which I'm really not going to talk about, which is uh, you know, an effort look at, at sort of developing a common API that allows these systems to move information back and forth. But when we think about Gobi and, and what we're working on, really the areas that we're focused on are, are providing interfaces for the lab. So these are people generating the data, sort of the frontline people you know, working with curation of this data. Obviously, the genomic data management, we have to be involved in uh, you know, linking the systems through, through Broppy, and this really is our, our focus, at least for version one of the Gobi system. It, there does have to be significant effort, though, in terms of coordination across these systems. That's something I think that has been missing to a large extent, is that uh, there's an idea that uh, different groups uh, can all be developing individually these different components, and somehow they're just they're all going to work together at the end. But I think we, we have a better understanding on that, and we're, we're, we're coordinating a lot more in terms of making sure that at the end of the day that there's a functional end-to-end -end system in place and not just a bunch of pieces of a functional system that don't actually work together. So now talking specifically about what we're doing with Gobi. So, you know, the you know, the initial, you know, discussions with our collaborators at the CG centers, I mean, it, it really became clear that the data management, curation, and quality control were, uh, you know, huge issues that had to be addressed. And until those were addressed, there was really no point in doing much of anything else because without that, you know, routine implementation of anything is, is, is not really going to happen. Um, and so, you know, for our phase one, we really, you know, we just said, you know what, First things first, let's take care of this problem. And so for phase one, we're really going to be working on getting a data warehouse in place. Uh, usable end-to-end -end system uh, allows them to load data and extract data. As we go into phase two, we're going to look at more targeted integration. So we know that there are other pieces out there that we have to integrate with and we have to communicate with. But that, that in and of itself is a, a huge undertaking. And so, you know, the strategy is, well, let's pick a few really key workflows that, that really require information to be passed across these systems, and let, let's get those up and, and running first and uh, try and deliver some good value in, in the near term. And then, you know, phase three, I, I would say this is a bit of a stretch goal, but uh, that really is trying to fully integrate these systems and, and integrate into the breeding process. And there's actually, we actually have been making some pretty good progress here. I know that there's some good strategies within CIMIT and ERIE for, for routine implementation of genomic selection. I, I think that, you know, having that strategy is, is the first key step, but they're, they're still really at the beginning of the journey in terms of actual implementation. But we can certainly help them with that significantly. In terms of the, the Gobi system, you know, what exactly is Gobi? Well, uh, you know, it's, it's not one thing exactly. It's a, it's a, it's a combination of, of databases and software. Um, really, we, we, we go all the way from after the data has been acquired um, to uh, analysis of, of, of the data, right? And so, we, we, we pull information from multiple sources. This could be from sample trackers, limb systems, 
Uh, this can be from germplasm management databases. Most of this is actually in flat files. Uh, we provide tools for validation, cleaning, transformation, aggregating, and, and loading. So we have a, a, you know, an ETL layer here written in Java, which you know, takes these, these files, breaks them up, digests them, and then pipes them into a, a data warehouse. The data warehouse we're working on, I'll talk a little bit more in the next slide, is actually a, a combination of multiple solutions. Uh, we have uh, analysis pipelines. We haven't done a lot of work on analysis pipelines yet. That's going to go more into to our phase two. But certainly things like imputation, certain bioinformatics pipelines, I, I think you want to have those integrated in the system. There are some analysis pipelines that need to be customized to such an extent that sort of building them into the back end of the code doesn't make a lot of sense. In that case, we're really going more towards an API approach, which is uh, we're putting the API layer in place. This allows us to move information back and forth between databases, but we also want to provide plugins. Initially, probably just exports of files, but, but ultimately we want to have plugins that will allow other analysis tools. You know, here we have some specific tools that we're working with, but also uh, you know, whether or not you're, you're doing some pipeline in Galaxy or you're doing some pipeline in R or whatever language it is you want to write your analysis pipeline in, you'll be able to plug directly into our, our middle layer API and pull information out to do these types of analyses. For the data warehouse itself, um, we have the data loader. This is currently a desktop application, although I think we're going to move it to a web application for our next release. Uh, metadata in and of itself is not overly uh, challenging in terms of the volume. Uh, we're using a traditional relational database for that. It's built in Postgres. Um, for loading data and appending data, we're using MonetDB, which uh, you know, whether or not MonetDB will stay in here moving forward is, is a bit of a question mark. But in terms of actual uh, storage of the, the, the genotypic data itself for access and querying, um, we found, at least in our initial phase of testing, that, that nothing really seemed to beat HDF5 in terms of speed of extraction. So the data itself is stored in HDF5, so you can use the, the metadata in Postgres uh, to be able to identify the file or files that you need to be pulling information from. There's a, a, a middle layer here, which uh, serves as the API, but also some back-end Java code that will then take that data, do any transformations that need to be done. All of this is requested through a data extraction. Um, it, it's, a, it's a web interface that you go and extract the data, and we'll deliver the extracts to you in an asynchronous uh, procedure where the, the data files will, you, you basically get an email and say your data is extracted with a link to the file. So in terms of our progress, um, the, the beta version was released in July of this year. Um, we, we pushed this out to Simit, Icrasat, and Erie. The idea here was to get some customer feedback on what we were doing to help us improve the system. Uh, what, we, what we put out had uh, the data loaders in place, the data warehouse in place. Uh, the ability to do data extraction, but not really a, a, a lot of filtering was available. It was very limited data extraction. The API was, uh, it certainly wasn't a broppy implementation. It was uh, you know, something we put together to be able to test some features, but there's clearly, you know, the reason it's in yellow, a, a lot of work that needed to be done for that. We also wanted to try and deliver some value uh, uh, you know, quickly, so we were wor working with you know, some partners at the, the James Hutton Institute, as well as uh, Diversity Rays, uh, to develop some things. And so pedigree verification and seed purity really came up to the top as, as a real obvious application of markers that could be useful to a lot of these breeding programs initially. So we worked on developing some pedvar and seed purity tools. Marker-assisted back crossing was being used fairly heavily in multiple breeding programs. So we developed a, a tool to, to make that process easier. And then the data curation tools and visualization tools, we're working with Diversity Array on that. We haven't released those yet, but they'll be coming out um, uh, quite soon, which will make it a lot easier to do quality control and data for the curators working with the database. So the data loader, you know, just a snapshot here. It's a, it's a, a Java program, um, enables you to come in. Uh, basically, you, 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 you fill in certain amounts of information, you point it to a file, uh, it generates a preview of that file. You then map the, the columns and rows in that file into basically what the, the columns in the database are, where it needs to be loaded. Uh, you click Submit. Um, 
Uh, it then runs this process asynchronously, and then we'll give you an email when your data has been successfully loaded in the database, or you know, less ideally, a, an email with error messages if, if something went wrong along the way. This, I, I think, generally was pretty well received in our beta, although there was a lot of issues with, I think, just the robustness of the system and usability, so we're actually going to be coming out with a new version of this. Uh, our first production release right now is scheduled for the first half of Q2, um, uh, 2017. Uh, uh, this is our, our data extractor. Um, you can see this is a, a, a mock-up right now, not a functional web UI. Um, but, but this is uh, what the, the extraction is going to look like for our, our um, production version, which we're releasing. Um, we still have somewhat limited extraction capabilities. Uh, you know, we wanted to get something functional in their hands as quickly as possible. So you have the ability to extract by a data set um, that can be based off a of PI, a project, a platform. Extract by samples, which actually ends up being more complicated than you'd think because there's different levels at which you can track samples and um, there's not always a lot of consistency with the coding that's used at these different centers. Um, but you have the ability to, to extract based off of what we call an external code. This is just some code that's generated external to our system and allows us to connect to, let's say, a breeding management system, uh, germplasm names, as well as the DNA samples, which these are the actual extractions that the genotyping data was run off. Uh, we extract into multiple formats. Basically, uh, HapMap and Flapjack are the primary formats that we're sporting right now. We'll have more formats that we support in the future. Uh, we also have the, the ability to extract by a list of markers as well. So you can provide a list of markers and pull data out that way. So just the timelines in terms of what we're doing. Uh, version 1 is coming out, uh, as I said, 2017. You know, based on feedback, we're looking for increased reliability, usable loader, extract, and some key molecular breeding tools. Um, the hope is that the latter half of 2017, after we've had our production system released and tested at the CG centers, we'll have our first sort of formal open source launch of the tool where uh, we'll have it available for, for anyone that, that, that wants to be able to use the system. Um, we're looking to do some targeted expansion of the user base. We're not, we don't really have resources to support a lot of people right now, but, but certainly groups that can uh, you know, have a lot of savvy in this area that are willing to work with us, we, we'd be more than happy to expand it. Version 2 for 2018, the idea is that the data management itself is going to be complete. We're going to have more targeted uh, breeding tools, uh, you know, some of the groundwork for integration. We're looking to actually start having workflows that go across systems, uh, supported extended uh, data types, and then our, our version 3 in 2019. Uh, we, should, we should have a good bit of the integration done uh, full functionality and core components and uh, really start getting into more of the direct breeder support, decision support making. And so that's all I had. Oh wait, so summary, you know, so the CG programs, you know, they need effective data management. Uh, we're targeting that early on. Um, you know, once we get that accomplished, we're going to go uh, and, and focus more on actual implementation of, of genomic selection. For integrated breeding support, uh, you know, th this is a, a real challenge because um, th there hasn't been, I don't think, enough collaboration across groups in this area. But, but I mean, really what we need is some well-defined use cases, some high-value applications that, that actually allow us to set joint um, goals across projects where we can do some joint dev sprints. Um, and, you know, we, we have to have a blueprint for, for how we think these systems are going to work together. Right now, BROP is a key component of that, but there's a little bit more than just defining the API in terms of how that, that, that integration is going to work. So that, I'll just close out. I mean, I would like to say that, you know, this is a pretty big project. There's a lot of people working on it, not just here at, at Cornell and, and Boyce Thompson, but, but also at the, the three centers, uh, Simmet, Icarsat, and, and Erie. With that, I'd be happy to take any questions you might have.